Hello, I'm here at Fight Camp with Mike Prendergast of the Historical Combat Academy. Did I get that right? Absolutely. Thank crikey, of Dublin. And um, we're here to demonstrate uh, some of the uses of the poleaxe. Now, the poleaxe is a weapon that belongs principally in the 15th century, starts a little bit earlier, it lingers a little bit later, but 15th century is its main homeland. And um, they're all the same, that they've got a bashy bit on one side, they've got a big spike on the top, and they've got something on this side. Sometimes it's an axe head like this, sometimes it's a crow's beak, but they've got something that's usually fairly hooky on that side. And importantly, they've always got us always have a spike of some sort on this end. And it's principally a spear with a couple of extra bits of cutlery added, but it's mainly a thrusting weapon. Um, now the shorter ones, uh, they were for knights and uh, the, they belonged to the, the era when guys were tanked up in a huge amount of armour, so you needed something that could threaten a huge swipe with a lot of power and had a lot of um, uh, thrusting uh, damage capability as well. These spikes were generally square in cross-section and, and not, not the, the flat spearhead, but a really solid spike for going through armour or going into chinks into, uh, into the mail of armpits and necks and the like. Um, there are pole axes or things that get called pole axes that are much taller. They're, they're up here somewhere. Um, uh, I would say that's more halberd territory. Uh, but uh, one characteristic is that pole axes tend to have an axe or uh, whatever they've got here uh, perpendicular to the shaft, whereas the halberds tend to uh, be angling more towards the user, so you'd be cutting towards you more. Uh, the longer ones tend to be used by the ordinary foot soldier and the shorter ones by the chaps in the expensive armour. Uh, anyway, we're just going to show you a few things that you can do with these, uh, the various uh, capabilities they have. The first one is what I mentioned already, which is the spear. So I go to, uh, no, he goes to spear me in the chest, and I counter, ha-ha, and then I spear him in the chest like that. So, the simple spear. So I should have been standing like this, was I? I, I wasn't paying attention. So let's do that one more time. He comes at me, I knock it aside, and I counter. But of course this can go wrong. Uh, for instance, uh, he might come at me, I might counter, and oh, he rides my momentum up there, and because I've stepped forward to get my thrust in, my right leg is within his measure, and he stabbed me with the spike on the feral end. Okay, and this reversing it to use the other end is very, very common. Also pretty handy if, if you're suddenly attacked from another direction, you can turn with it very quickly that way. Uh, but you've got a big bashy bit as well, so um, obviously, I could threaten to bash him, and if I do a really big swing from out here somewhere, he's going to have to react to this, because this is a really powerful attack. So he's going to need something pretty powerful to stop it. So he comes swinging out there, but ha-ha, it was a feint, and then I skewer him. And in a lot of the, the, the plays and the treatises, that's the main use for the hammer. It's not actually for hitting the other guy, it's for forcing him to do what I want to do by threatening him with such a strong attack that he ends up swinging wildly offline, opening some part of him for a thrust. But sometimes the hammer does do its job. So, for instance, uh, being a bit fury about it, he was a, a, an Italian treatise writer, I might have my hands quite close together and use this a bit like a longsword. Really wind up. This is the pasta de del donna, the, the, the position of the woman. The and I'm going to really whack it with a hammer as this massive air goes by. Oh no! Really horribly wrong. I had to put so much oomph into this that I overswung, and there's no way I could get back in time. He saw it coming, he simply used footwork to get out of measure, and um, I'm now dead. Um, another thing they have, if you remember, was a hook. So uh, we could get quite hooky about it. I might come in against him, he might counter, I might try something else, but oh, I get my leg too close, and then he. Wah, wah. Oh! And uh, a move that, uh, this is Fiore again, isn't it? it is. Okay, this is another Fiore move, which I rather like. Um, this is where you get into grappling. So I get into here perhaps, and now it's difficult to, to, to get any, any um, end on to him. But what I can do, you see how close my hand is to his staff? I can just do that. And if I'm quick, I can get to there, and now, um, yes, this did fall on me and uh, did hurt a little bit, but if I were wearing a helmet, that would be fine. I would now surprise him and using my whole body weight, turn away from him, twisting his arms across each other. Now I've got all the leverage and he's got none. I use the leverage of his weapon against him and I've got 
two pole axes and therefore I win. Because as we all know, it's the one with the most pole axes at the end uh, wins. Indeed. Mike, thank you very much for coming along and showing us these moves. Thank you.